Welcome once again to Captain Fred's Aviation Theater. Today we're at Ramona Airport and we're visiting with Terry Robinson, who is the program director of Classic Rotors. We'll explain what that is in just a little bit. Terry, you're going to tell our viewers the history or the scope of helicopters, and I believe you said it started actually in China. Would you tell our viewers about that? Yes, uh, thank you, Captain Fred, for coming out to visit us. Uh, as we understand it, the Chinese, through some documented records, did have little toys that resembled rotor blades such as this. That, they uh, still sell those. They still sell them. In fact, that's where I purchased this, was at an air show. And uh, the Chinese have documented records that they actually did fly these as toys, probably patterned after some seed pods that fall from trees that spin like mm -hmm. rotors. Okay. Uh, do you know what year that would have been, or what uh, era? It was during the first and second century AD. The first and second century, that's before Leonardo da Vinci. Yes, and that leads us into the next documented uh, aviation um, pioneer. Uh, Leonardo da, da Vinci um, actually has some, some nice drawings uh, of what he called the helical screw, uh, which uh, he determined by using starched linens as a large sail in the form of a screw, if turned fast enough, could actually propel itself into the air. And uh, it has been uh, uh, theoretically uh, looked at and determined that that is correct. If it had enough airspeed, it would have done that. And a, a propeller or a rotor is actually called an air screw. That is correct. Yes, it is. Okay. But the first, what we would recognize or call a helicopter, was built in 1922. Would you tell our viewers about that? That is the first actual uh, sustained flight of uh, something that resembled a helicopter. That is correct. There were other, uh, uh, the actual first flight of a uh, helicopter, although it was not a sustained flight, was in 1907. And the first flight achieved uh, 12 inches off the ground and the second one up to five feet. But they were very unstable with no forward motion capability. In fact, they needed uh, uh, several people with sticks around it to, to hold it so it oh, would stay right? stable. Uh -huh. So 1907, November 13th, was the first date of a, of a helicopter flight but not a sustained flight and not one under any kind of control. Tell us about the 1922 flight. It, uh, I know it went forward at eight miles an hour and went up to 30 feet. Yes, uh, Juan de la Serva was the, uh, he was from Argentina, but spent a lot of time in Europe, in all the countries of Europe, gathering data and had the, uh, really developed the first uh, uh, flyable uh, helicopter with any kind of controllability. And um, he actually did uh, uh, fly it uh, actually around a closed course. And he was also one of the pioneers that developed some of the first capability for hinged helicopter wings. Now he's actually known for auto gyros. Yes, he was the first one to actually perform an auto gyro, which is the ability of a helicopter to land without power. But the, the things that he developed for auto gyros became valuable and were incorporated into helicopters. Yes, there's no one single individual in the history of helicopters that's credited with the development of helicopters. It was a series of events, uh, little pieces developed by many, many individuals that all came together in the late 40s. You know, the gun is the same way. <laughs> uh, there were 80, 90 people that developed one tiny little thing that advanced the gun, and over two or three piece by piece, step by step, with little improvements. So it, it's not just the helicopter. Yes, uh, unlike the Wright brothers, who are credited with the winged aircraft, the first flight, helicopters have no one individual that's credited as the first uh, pioneer. Let's move on. After Juan de Sierra and his uh, auto gyros, uh, I believe what they call the first practical helicopter was uh, Heinrich Fokker, not Anthony Fokker, uh, <laughs> who built the World War I airplanes, but Heinrich Fokker. Would you tell our viewers about his helicopter? Well, in 1936, the uh, Germans, with the pressure of Hitler, uh, were trying to advance the state of art, state of the art in all fields. And they developed, uh, using some of the patterns from some of the other pioneers, they developed a twin lateral helicopter. The side-by-side, side rotors by side. were side-by-side. Side. That's uh -huh. correct. 
and uh, that was actually considered very stable in its time. And uh, they did set uh, some altitude records and speed records with that helicopter. Um, one of the first altitude records being over 6,000 feet and uh, uh, over 80 miles an hour. Uh, and subsequently, that was set by a woman. <laughs> yes, it was, and she was uh, uh, Hitler's uh, personal uh, uh, pilot. Mm -hmm. And uh, she actually uh, demonstrated the helicopter in an enclosed stadium in 1938 and uh, showed how stable it was to fly that aircraft. I want to emphasize that. Uh, Hannah Reich was Hitler's personal pilot, and she flew that helicopter in the sports arena in a closed stadium every night for eight days during an athletic event to show how stable it was. That's and correct. she would sit there with her legs crossed and her arms crossed and look around and fly that thing inside the stadium. Yes, and there were a number of other uh, U.S. Pi aviation pioneers that were in attendance there as well. Uh, Lindbergh, Charles Lindbergh was there to uh, view that, as well as Igor Sikorsky. And it's thought that after seeing that demonstration, they uh, brought those uh, uh, renewed emphasis back to the United States to begin working on helicopters again. Now, about the same time, a Russian immigrant to the United States, Igor Sikorsky, was also working on helicopters. Would you tell our viewers what his contributions were? Well, Igor Sikorsky, at a very, very early age, uh, in his teenage years, uh, was really developing aircraft, aircraft components, and in, uh, in Russia. And in 1909, uh, 1909 uh, he actually developed a helicopter. Uh, he watched the one in 1907 first fly, and took the uh, plans with him developed a flying helicopter, but unfortunately, the power to weight ratio of engines in those days did not allow it to take off with a person on board. He did build some models that were flyable, and then because he could not fly in it, decided to give up on helicopters at that time. Um, after he viewed the um, German uh, exhibition and the stability of helicopters in the 30s, he put renewed interest in it and started uh, developing helicopters again in the late 30s, and in 1939 developed the VS-300, which became the first really practical, truly stable helicopter. Now he used, uh, to counteract the torque of the rotor, he used two horizontal rotors, tail rotors, but then he later went to one vertical tail rotor, which is what most people used after that. That is correct. Mm -hmm. Yes, he did. Uh, there was a young man who was building models at that time who went to work for Bell. Would you tell our viewers about his models and what he developed? Well, Arthur E. Young was a, um, uh, an engineer, and he built a lot of models that had uh, engines, uh, electric motors uh, tied with electric cables so he could get all the power he needed in the models to demonstrate uh, theory and work out a lot of the theoretical problems that helicopters had with stability in those days. He put a lot of uh, hours, a lot of work into that and subsequently is noted for building uh, stability into helicopters and uh, was funded in later years through Bell Helicopter and it's because of his efforts the Bell Helicopter became what it is today. And he developed what is known as the Bell Model 47, yes, which everybody knows from Korea and MASH. Yes, and is one of the most uh, widely built, uh, most highly produced helicopters there is. And still in use today in Absolutely. large numbers. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, up to that point then, after that, in the 1950s, there was an explosion of different types and models of helicopters. Well, during the 1950s, um, there were over 300 different individual projects going on. Every aircraft manufacturer wanted to have their name on a helicopter. And um, really the four that came out of that were the Piasecki, Hiller, Bell, and Sikorsky became the named helicopter manufacturers. Uh, all the other pioneers had little developments that uh, in some way added to the development of helicopters, but those were the big names that got the big military contracts and went on to build very large helicopters, all but uh, 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 Hiller are still in operation today. One of the most uh, famous, I think, was probably the Sky Crane. Is that what they called it? Yes. Tell our viewers what it did. Well, the S-64 Sky Crane was really developed to be able to pick up boxcars uh, or large buses or containers with people in them called pods. And uh, it could carry um, uh, 50,000 pounds of cargo. 
and it could fly a distance of about 250 miles. Uh, today they're still being used. In fact, uh, around Southern California here, we see them being used as firefighting, uh, being able to lift large amounts of water to, uh, to fight forest fires. Okay, that brings us up to modern day times, and we're gonna talk about the helicopter behind us and its role in history and what you're doing with it here at Ramona right after we come back from this very important message. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Captain Fred's Aviation Theater. With us now is Mark DeShero, who is the pilot of this helicopter behind us. Mark, would you tell our viewers uh, when and how this helicopter came into being? Well, this particular helicopter uh, was decommissioned out of Langley Air Force Base in 1972. To the best of our knowledge, it was the, the last helicopter to be decommissioned as far as the series in H-21. So that's of historical significance in itself. Yes, and I believe that's why this aircraft has probably survived at this point, because it was the last one to be used. Uh, when was it built and what was it used for? This one was built in August of 57. Excuse me, when was the first one of this type oh, built? The first one, uh, first prototype flew in 52. And then this particular one came out in August of uh, 57. And originally they were referred to as Pisekis because he's the one who developed and, and built them. But then in 55, the company was taken over and they renamed it Vertol. And so this is actually a Vertol uh, version of the Pisekis. We fly an air coupe, which later became an Alon. I see. So uh, it, it changed hands. All right. Um, what was its primary use? Well, the primary use when they built this was uh, used in Vietnam. It was primary use for a troop carrier, transport, and also medevac. It has the ability to handle uh, 12 stretchers. So it was a very good machine for medevac. And uh, when it was in the troop configuration, it held 20 uh, fully outfitted troops in the, in the cabin. Let's talk about its performance a little bit. Uh, what kind of engines does it have? Well, this particular aircraft is running a Curtis Wright 1820, which uh, it's probably more famous to be said that the 1820s were used on B-17s. So that gives a little idea of the age of the, uh, of the Does engine. it have two engines or does it run off of one? It only has a single engine and it accomplished is the, the drivetrain through uh, transmissions and um, drive shafts. Just like a car. That's correct, mm -hmm. that's correct. People always wonder, well, how do you make sure that the uh, rotor blades stay in synchronization so you don't have contact? And here again, the transmissions maintain that synchronization and uh, you will never have a, a problem with the blades uh, contacting one another. Uh, you can take off vertically? Uh, that is correct. Uh, also, this machine, since it is on wheels, uh, I think it was uh, in, in the early days, they, they built a lot of helicopters on wheels because that allowed you to get a running takeoff mm -hmm. and a little more airspeed over the, uh, the rotor blades, and that would allow additional lift. Uh, what is the cruising speed? Cruising speed of this aircraft is about 85 knots, and it has a max speed. Which in miles would be? Well, miles an hour, I believe that's around 90 three miles an hour, somewhere close to that. Not all of our viewers know what a knot is. I see. I it's see. a nautical mile. Uh, and, and the max speed on this thing would be uh, 120 knots, which would equate to about 130, 132 miles an hour. Would it be redlined at 130? Most definitely. Mm -hmm. So, but you would cruise mostly, what, 90, something like that? Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how much fuel would it drink an hour? Well, it all depends on what our particular load is. We can get down as low as 80 gallons per hour, uh, and it can be as high as 120 gallons per hour. What would make the difference? Uh, just, just mainly the gross weight of the aircraft. If we're fully loaded and, and approaching the gross weight of the aircraft, then we're going to be uh, sucking down fuel at the rate of uh, two gallons a minute. Two gallons a minute? That's correct. There's 60 minutes in an hour. Yeah, there's 120 gallons. At $2 a gallon. Right. I, I tell people today one dollar is worth maybe about 15 seconds of flight time. 
Yeah, well, that's $240 an hour to fly this uh, helicopter. That's correct. Yeah. Which leads us into what you're doing here. Now, you have this helicopter and some other helicopters or some other aircraft here at Ramona Airport, and it's what you call a flying museum? That's correct. We refer to ourselves as Classic Rotors. And, Which uh, is a nonprofit organization. That's correct. We're a 501c3. And uh, we were established in 1992. And we've been uh, slowly accumulating uh, helicopters through the donations of, uh, of the public and also uh, corporate entities that help us out. We've now, we've seen you uh, at Gillespie Airport for the Confederate Air Force Air Show. And then we flew with you up to March Air Force Base. And uh, you were at Torrance or someplace up in L.A. before that. Yeah, we generally have a show schedule that encompasses about 20 air shows within the Southern California area. We go as far north as uh, Point Magoo, uh, also uh, Edwards Air Force Base, and we go as far east as uh, Yuma. Now, when you make these trips, uh, if, uh, if somebody is a volunteer crew member, uh, do, do they take uh, vacation days and go with you, or how do you work that? Uh, well, we do have several members that belong to the museum, as well as crew members. These are members that actually fly with us uh, to the air shows. Generally, uh, we'll leave on a Friday, so a lot of our volunteers are able to get that time off. And uh, other times, though, we just tend to hop the aircraft from air show to air show. So the uh, Sunday afternoon uh, after the air show's over, we will then fly it to the next air show location and, and leave it there. And then we all ride by car the, the following uh, Saturday or two weeks later, whenever the air show is. So you would, um, let's say you, you finished at uh, the Confederate Air Force uh, show, Wings Over Gillespie, right. and your next gig was March Air Force Base. That's correct. So instead of bringing it back here to Ramona, you would fly it directly from Gillespie up to your next spot and leave it there until the next air show. That is correct. Mm -hmm. yes. And that saves uh, two gallons of gas a second or whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, well, you, you can't afford to bring it back to its home base every time with those expenses. That, that's correct. And then the other problem is, is just the preparation for this aircraft. Uh, you're basically, first of all, pre-flighting a helicopter, which is, it takes a lot more time an effort than, say, pre-flighting your average fixed-wing aircraft. Also, since we are a tandem, it's almost like you're pre-flighting two helicopters yeah. simultaneously. Well, it's like a twin engine. You've got two of everything. That's correct. And then um, we have uh, blade covers because the blades are made out of wood, so you have to remove those. Oh, the blades are made out of wood? Yes. These. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, these rotor blades, um, it has a metal spar going down through the center, but then all the ribs are wood glued onto that spar, and then you have a piece of mahogany glued over to create the airfoil amongst all the ribs. And then it has stainless steel leading edges that are just glued on uh, to the leading edge and the trailing edge. Well, I used to have a 1946 air knocker, an Aronka uh -huh. Chief, and it had a wooden propeller. Uh -huh. And I had to have a, a rubberized canvas cover to put on that propeller because it was wood. Right. So you have to do the same thing with these. Yeah, so preparation for flight is, is, uh, takes a lot of time. It, it could take as much as uh, an entire day just to prepare it for the flight. I can understand that. So uh, that's another major reason why we try to limit the flights. If we were then to fly it here to Ramona in between each show, that's a whole other uh, pre-flight necessary. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you're based here at Ramona Airport. Uh, is your hangar open to the public if they wanted to come out and see your, your helicopters or, or inquire about uh, your, what you're doing? Yes, that's correct. Uh, we kind of refer to our facility up here as a restoration facility opposed to an actual museum since we are a flying museum and we take uh, our exhibits to the public at the local air shows. But up here in Ramona we do have a restoration facility. They're welcome to come in and take a look and see some of the helicopters that we're working on. What else do you have besides this one? Oh, incidentally, this one I believe is the only flying flying banana in the world. Yeah, this is the only H-21B uh, flying in the world at this time. And it, its nickname is the flying banana. Yes, uh, people do refer to it as that. And it's the only one that's flying in the world today. So that's, that's of historical significance in itself. They could come here to Ramona Airport and see the only one of this kind flying in the world. Yes, and that's kind of the mission statement of Classic Rotors, is to uh, get a collection of helicopters uh, that are unusual in one way or the other. 
Uh, in the case of uh, rotor systems, this particular one is a tandem rotor because you have a rotor forward and aft. They also, uh, we have a Russian Kamov, which is coaxial rotor design. This is where you have an upper and lower rotor, both on the same shaft. And then uh, we also have a Hiller Hornet, which uses ramjet propulsion on the tips of the... Yes, uh, has blade. little jet engines on the tips of the rotors. That is correct. Mm -hmm. And that's what... So the, that doesn't need a tail rotor. No, and in this particular case, it doesn't need a tail rotor for the purpose of anti-torque, but is it does need uh, a, a tail rotor to give you some yaw authority if you want the aircraft to turn right or left. And then we also have uh, a HUP helicopter, which is the little brother to this uh, H-21. Mm -hmm. It's about I half see a size. lot of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but none are flying yet, so we're looking uh, forward to getting that one flying, and uh, we'll have another one-of-a-kind uh, aircraft in the air. We also have a... Um, S-55, which was built by Sikorsky, they also refer to them as H-19s in the military. This is one of the first uh, large helicopters ever deployed, and it uh, was first used in the Korean War. And this is a helicopter of what we consider standard configuration. It has a single rotor and then a, a tail rotor. Mm -hmm. Well, I salute you. You're very ambitious. Uh, hopefully, the public will come up and uh, take a look at the helicopters that they have. Uh, this is Captain Fred saying, I love airplanes and helicopters, and I honor the people who fly them. That's our show for today. We hope you enjoyed it. We certainly enjoyed bringing it to you. I'd like to thank the San Diego Aerospace Museum, the first place to visit when you come to San Diego, for bringing aviation theater to you. Until next week, this is Captain Fred saying, God bless America and happy landing.